to Next Page Live. It's a WPL program where library staff from around the system get around to share our love of reading with you, the community. Each episode has a theme and the staff, all of us, make uh, specific selections of books read and enjoyed to share with you. And today's theme is reads that make great holiday gifts. Every book is available in the library collection, sometimes in multiple formats, and the book in every episode are listed in an info guide that you can refer back to on our website. We put the link into the to the info guide in the chat, wherever that is, it's somewhere around here. Um, and you can find it on the website under the Ask Us box with a rectangular button that says Info Guides. So if you're not familiar with that, you go to the WPL webpage, click on Info Guides, scroll down and select your next great read, and you select Next Page Live on the next page. And then you will see all of the books available today. As you gathered when it said you're being recorded, each session of the program is recorded so you can refer back in case, you know, you wish, miss our witty banter or just want to get those books again. So how does this work? In a round robin style, each staff member is going to take a turn talking about a book. And at the end, there will be a time for a lightning round of book presentations, two of them, in fact. As you know, we are on Zoom and technical difficulties do occur. Please keep yourself muted with your video off. And if you have any connection issues, just go out and come back in. And as I said, we have a technical human who will let you back in. Um, we also have a chat open. So if you have any questions or if you just wanna gush about a book that you love, um, please feel free, it's open for discussion. So let's do a little round of introductions with our library staff in the order that we are presenting tonight. So we're gonna wave to the nice people when I say your name. I am Courtney, I'm your host, and I am the Idea Mill Librarian here at Millennium. Next today will be, this way is Toby, who is an outreach librarian here at Mill. Then next will be Carly, who is the branch head librarian at Harvey Smith. And then we have Tegan, who is the youth services librarian here at Mill. And with that, let's get going. Oh man, I'm first. Ah, oh. <laughs> okay. I made picks for different age groups and types of some of my absolute favorites that I have bought as gifts and will do so again for every possible opportunity because they're my absolute favorite. So I'm starting with one of my, like my favorite author with her first series that she did for kids. This is a long title. It's called The Girl Who Circumnavigated Fairyland in a Ship of Her Own Making. And that's by Catherine M. Valente. It's middle grade fiction, um, fantasy. It's available in the collection as print and an audiobook. It's around 274 pages and it is a series. So this is the first in a series of five. So this is the best review that I got for this was hilarious. The tagline is this, think the phantom toll booth crossed with the Wizard of Oz infused with the absurdity of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. And that's pretty much this book in a nutshell. So I'll give you a little rundown. Once upon a time in Omaha, Nebraska, a child named September is visited by the green wind and spirited away to fairyland on the back of the Leopard of Little Breezes. Things are not going well in fairyland. The new Marquis is unpredictable and fickle and also not that much older than September. Only September can retrieve a talisman that the Marquis wants from the enchanted woods. And if she doesn't, then the Marquis is gonna make life impossible for the inhabitants of fairyland, you know, as they do. September is hesitant to aid the Marquis in her plans, but the offer provides her an opportunity to help friends she has met on her journey. So themes, magic, quests, parallel universes, and imaginary places. The tone is very whimsical, but the language is really sophisticated. Catherine Valente has like a lot of degrees in a lot of very impressive things. And so this is for advanced readers. Um, it's very character driven. I say it's the perfect read for a strong reader that has already read the commonly found fairy tales and fantasy things. So it could be, I am 40, so I find this enjoyable, but I also bought it for my niece who is 10. So as long as it's someone who likes the genre and has kind of read other things, they're gonna like this one. 
Um, I would say an honorable mention would be the rest of the series. All five books are great. Two thumbs up from me. <laughs> All right, which means it is now Toby's. All right, thank you, Courtney. That sounds fascinating. I love the name September. That's such a it's such a great name. Um, my first pick is nonfiction. It's the book An Immense World: How Animal Senses Reveal the Hidden Realms Around Us by Ed Yong. Um, this is nonfiction, and this is kind of like for your dad who probably only reads nonfiction and loves annoying his family with random facts. Um, I read this book a couple months ago, and I knew immediately that I was going to talk about it today. Um, it's it's exactly what the subtitle says. Young writes about how animals use their senses um, to perceive the world, and often it's extremely different from the way that we use our senses. And so um, the book goes through each of the senses. Each chapter is a sense, sight, touch, hearing, smell, and taste, and then it explores the unique ways that animals use those senses. And you just, you learn the most fascinating things about animals as you read this, like um, the fact that birds, birds can see way more colors than humans. Like you couldn't even imagine the colors that birds can see. Um, a catfish, um, their whole body is covered in taste buds. So if you were to lick a catfish, you would taste each other at the same time. I don't know why you would wanna lick a catfish, but that's something that you could do. Um, an eagle can spot a rat from a mile away. Um, an echolocating dolphin, because sound waves can penetrate flesh in water, would be able to perceive your lungs and your skeleton. I mean, it's so fascinating. I mean, don't even get me started on turtles and magnetic fields. Um, there's just so much good stuff in here. It's incredibly well-researched and well-written. Yang writes with a lot of empathy and humor. There's some really great footnotes of all things in here. Um, he does get a little science jargony at times, but don't let that dissuade you. This is one of the most fascinating books I've ever read, and I think um, everyone would love it. Um, so with that, I will pass it on to Carly. Thank you, Toby. I'm not really big on nonfiction, but I kind of want to read that now. That sounds, all those facts sound so fascinating, especially the catfish one. Uh, makes me wonder if they're just tasting the sea the entire time that they're swimming. <laughs> okay, so the first book I chose is called The Twyford Code. It's by Janice, Janice Hallett. And it's an adult uh, mystery book. It's told through a series of recordings done by the main character, whose name is Smithy. He um, found a book when he was a kid and he brought it in the class because he couldn't read. He was dyslexic and he had reading issues. And his teacher at the time, Miss Stiles, took the book and she recognized it and she was very interested in the whole thing because apparently the book, which is called The Super Six on Gold Top Hill, uh, has codes in it. If you can crack the code, you'll find a treasure. And so she takes this book and she takes the whole class on a trip to see Edith Twyford's house where she wrote the books. And at the end of the trip, which only takes a day, the teacher has disappeared with the book. We're not quite sure. Smithy can't really remember what happened. So cut to 40 years later, Smithy's getting out of prison and he decides he's gonna crack the case. He's, he's learned how to read while he's been in prison. And he's found another copy of the book, and he's just decided he's going to not only crack the code, but he's going to find out what happened to his teacher. And it's told through a series of recordings that he's making um, on his phone. And it's him reconnecting with his classmates and them all trying to figure out what happened. It's kind of equal parts mystery and character study. So if you know someone who likes mysteries, but likes also getting to know more about the characters and what's happening to them, it's really good for that. You get to learn about Smithy and over the time, what happened to lead from being a schoolboy to coming out of prison uh, 40 years later. And also what happened to all his friends and his son. And there's like a lot of just really, really sweet and bittersweet character development, learning how his life went this way and how that's tied in with the book and his teacher. And it's just like really well done because even though when I read a mystery, my number one thing is I want to know what happened. There were times when he was just talking about his life, and I kind of was more interested in that, and I wanted to know more about what happened to him all these years. So it does a really good job of 
interweaving the two things and making you really care about the characters. And I've really come to love this author. Um, so it's the Twyford Code. Highly recommend it. On to you, Tegan. Thank you so much, Carly. I love mystery, so that sounds awesome. Uh, so because I am a youth services librarian, I just to focus my picks on books for the kids in your life or, you know, just around the children topics. So my first one is for kids who are probably about two to seven. I think this book would fit in, especially for the three to fives. This is just absolute gold. It's called Crunch the Shy Dinosaur. Um, and it's at the library. It's really wonderful. This book is, um, the best part of this book is it encourages children to interact with you and with the book while you're reading it. It's all about a shy little dinosaur that you need to talk to and entice out of his shyness. Um, but the good news is that once you get him on your side, he gets very uncomfortably close to you. It's a really fun, really cute book. Um, I read it to my own three-year-old and she just started sort of doing the words and stuff with me. So I can just definitely guarantee you this book is a hit with kids and it is very, very funny. So I'm gonna pass things back over to Courtney. I believe I know that author and I've read other things by him and they are hilarious. I used to do them in school. I'm another favorite. I'm hidden with a fan favorites of mine today. So if you haven't heard of Shauna McGuire and you don't know the Wayward Children series, you're welcome because these are amazing and everyone needs to read them. These are adult fiction books. They're fantasy books. They're very short. They're only about 146 pages. So each one of them is very compact, but they are jam packed full of stories. Um, there will be 10 of them. The next one comes out in January, but this is number eight. So the tagline for this one is welcome to the shop where the lost things go. If you've ever lost a sock, you'll find it. If you ever wondered about that favorite toy from childhood, it's probably sitting on a shelf in the back. And the headphones that you swore you'd keep safe, you guessed it. Antonin has lost her father, metaphorically. He's not in the shop and she'll never see him again. But when Ansi finds herself lost, literally this time, she finds that however many doors open for her, leaving the shop for good might not be as simple as it sounds, and stepping through the doors exacts a price. The clock in the moment in town tells us that childhood and innocence once lost can never be found. Um, each one of these books has characters that kind of interweave back onto each other, but they can each be read as a standalone, and the order is murky at best like you don't really need to start at one but it is it builds up nicely when you do um i will say there is a trigger warning for this one it does hint around abuse at the beginning and it does quite clearly state that it doesn't go into depth or anything but when they're wayward children and they're getting lost sometimes there are reasons for that. um themes are about misfits parallel universes identity and imaginary places um these are Perfect reads for someone who likes short, immersive reads about magical misfits. So it's kind of, they're at a boarding school for like magic-ish things. So I could repeat my it's better than Harry Potter again. I'll leave it up to you. Um, yeah, all of the series is good. So I would say, check those out. They are available in the catalog. These ones are print, large print, ebook, and audiobook. So you can have them any which way. All right, Toby, your turn. All right, thank you. Um, my next book is um, Tom Lake by Ann Patchett. Um, this is for probably like a mom or mom figure in your life, someone who would, you know, maybe stop on the street to admire and identify flowers. Um, this is just like, a, it's a gorgeous book. It's about um, a family who runs a cherry farm in the Midwest. It's set at the very beginning of the COVID pandemic. And there are three daughters in this family. Um, they're young adults and their lives have all been put on pause. So they've come home to the cherry farm and they're helping with the harvest because there's no workers. Um, and while they harvest their mom, Laura, she tells them about her former life as an actress and her short lived romance with someone who went on to become a very famous movie star. 
Um, and it's just, it's so beautiful. It's, um, if you haven't read any Anne Patchett before, I think she just writes with so much empathy, um, so much humanity. Um, I'm a huge fan of hers and I think this is one of her best. Um, it's really a meditation on family and nostalgia and theater. And it's really perfect for this time of year because it is set in just the most luscious, Midwestern summer. It's a cherry farm. I mean, it's just, it's so beautiful. Um, and if audiobooks are your thing, this one is narrated by Meryl Streep. So you can't go wrong with that. Um, just, just a gorgeous book, a beautiful cover. And um, I just, I want to, I want to hug this book. That's, that's the sort of feelings I have about it. Um, now I'll pass it back to Carly. Thank you so much. So my next choice is for someone in your life who's always wanted to read Stephen King, but doesn't like horror. I love horror and I love Stephen King and especially his horror, but this book, 112263, is my favorite Stephen King book and is not in any way horror. It's sort of sci-fi, but also just kind of daily life of this guy. Um, so it's all about a time portal in the back of the diner there's this man named Jake who knows the diner owner and the diner tell uh, the owner tells him that he has found a portal that leads to September 9th 1958 in the back of his diner and he can go in there and he can change things and he'll remember what happened originally he'll be able to see if what he did changed anything if it was just like not a big impact at all and he's decided he wants to go and stop the assassination of JFK by Lee Harvey Oswald. But unfortunately, the diner owner dies before then. But he asks Jake to do it and to do it for him. And at first, Jake's kind of like not wanting to get involved with that. But he eventually does. So he has to basically go back to 19, 1958 and wait for, for four years until he can get to the assassination date. He... Um, doesn't want to do it right like he doesn't want to go and like do something right away he wants to wait until the date just in case something happens that he's unaware of and, like there's a ripple effect so it's easier to do it as close to the day as possible so he goes back to the 50s 1958 and the majority of the book is just him living in the 50s and 60s waiting for this to happen and that's the part that i really loved was all these things he does to kind of live in the moment like live in this time period but also not make any huge ripples because obviously that'll have an impact in the future it's just his like day-to-day -day life his meeting people his trying to help people the best he can forming relationships getting a good job like just really becoming like in love with his own life and finding happiness and joy and then all the time you know you're aware like okay at some point he has to go and you know stop lee harvey oswald and then presumably go back to his own time. So there's kind of like this bittersweet sense of finality because you know something's going to happen. But it's still like it really catches you and just draws you in and makes you just kind of not forget about it, but just get immersed in his daily life. And I just, I love it so much. Um, so it's really good if, you, if you've always wanted to try Stephen King, but you don't like horror because there's like, there's normal horror, like violence and stuff, but there's not like monsters. So um, it is, it's an amazing book. I love it so much. And uh, we have it in the collection. So if you want to give it a go, 10 out of 10 stars, two thumbs up for me. And uh, now on to Aiden. Thanks, Carly. All right, so my next pick is The Lost Library by Rebecca Stead. Uh, this one is so popular that all the books are checked out right now. So I had to print off the book cover so you guys could see it. Um, I would say this one is a juvenile fiction. It's middle grade. So I would say this one would be good for sort of nine to 12 year olds is where I would peg it. Strong eight year olds, maybe. Um, and this book is for, it's for the book kids in your life. I was a book kid. You know, I'm sure that a lot of you guys are book kids too. Those kids that just really love books. Yeah. So it's all about a lost library. Um, there is a really great mystery element to it. The characters are all really warm. And um, uh, it has, it's one of those great books that has a really strong plot with really strong characters. And um, it's just a really engaging read. I think that kids who love books and kids who love mysteries will really enjoy this title. 
And I'm going to pass things over to Courtney. Not going to lie, I have that on hold already <laughs> because I love reading middle grade fiction because it's just nice and bite sized and just you always know it ends well, right? Yeah, book kids, you know, we are who we are. Okay, I'm going to totally shift my gears away from like magical parallel universes and go uh, nonfiction. And it's one of my favorite things I've read this year. And it's a feminist tome, which is also kind of in my wheelhouse. It's called Honor Best Behavior, The Seven Deadly Sins and the Price Women Pay to Be Good by Elise Lunin. It's her author debut. Um, it is adult nonfiction. It is really requested in the system. So we have it as a print, an ebook, or an audiobook. It is 384 pages. And you got to go chapter by chapter and really absorb this one because there's a lot going on. So the basic tagline is, this is a groundbreaking exploration of the ancient rules that women unwittingly follow in order to be considered good, revealing how the seven deadly sins still control and distort our lives and illuminate a path to a more balanced, spiritually complete way to live. Um, it's just talking about how a lot of Western culture is really um, has a lot of behavioral expectations for women and how we're just kind of set up with the patriarchy to uh, lose. <laughs> it's, um, it's heavy. It's really good. But what she does is she kind of refers to her own experiences. And then she goes into how there's just kind of a cultural programming by this that causes us to behave in certain ways and to be accepted only if we behave in those ways. Otherwise, we're found inferior. Um, so there are the seven deadly sins, but she adds sadness back to the list, which is really interesting, um, and devotes each chapter to each concept and goes back through time and gets other people's experiences in on it too. Um, it's really interesting. While it, while it, like, it sounds very religious, it's actually not. It's just examining how culture behaves in a different way. Um, and it does appeal to a wide audience. Um, Elise is a host of a podcast you may have heard of called Pulling the Thread. So I would say this is a read for feminists searching for their next great read, or for anyone who's looking to kind of examine culture and its effect on behavior in a different way. So it may not be for everybody, but honestly, I gave it five stars. It's like, I wanna buy it. And I tend to just borrow from the library now because I read a lot. So I highly, recommend this one it's super good toby your turn um i am definitely reading that one that sounds right up my alley it's so good yeah that sounds up yeah um, you've sold me um all right my next pick is northwoods um by daniel mason this is for the people in your life who like capital l literature um don't recommend this for people who only read james patterson who only read colleen hoover this is not for them. Um, this is like for your aunt who keeps a dictionary by her bedside table. Um, and I mean, don't let that dissuade you. This is an accessible book, but it is, like I said, it's it's literary um, and it, it makes no bones about that. Um, this is a bit of a hard book to talk about because it's essentially about a house and um, the generations of people who call that house home over a period of about 300 years. Um, so it starts with two lovers who abscond from a Puritan colony and make a life for themselves in a cabin in the woods. Um, but we also get the story of an apple farmer and um, his twin daughters. We get a lovelorn painter, an abolitionist. Um, we get the, there's a panther, a catamount throughout the novel. Um, we even hear from a kind of horny beetle. Um, <laughs> This book that really gives me um, like Cloud Atlas or the Overstory vibes. If you read and liked those, I think you'd be really into this. It's super inventive and magical and really talks about the ways that we're connected to our environment, but also each other. Um, I have a feeling this one is going to win a bunch of awards. Um, the New York Times and the Washington Post just named it as one of their best books of the year. So read it, recommend it, get it for others, and they'll be super impressed that you had the foresight 
um, to read this book or recommend it or get it for them before it, you know, won the Pulitzer or whatever. Um, so that is Northwoods by Daniel Mason. Um, on to you, Carly. That is high praise. I might need to check that book out. So my next choice is for people who want to get into graphic novels or who already are into graphic novels and they just need another suggestion. It is called Saga. It's by Brian K. Vaughan. He writes if you want to tables, does the illustrations. It's uh, what it says. It's a saga. It goes for the entire life of this child whose parents were from warring planets. Well, one's a planet, one's a moon. And her mother has wings, and she's from this technologically advanced planet called Landfall. And her father has horns, and he's from the satellite moon of Landfall, and he has um, the ability to do magic. And the planet and the moon have been at war for so long that no one knows why they're at war. But it's, it's throughout the galaxy. And so when they fall in love and they have a child and they do this all, you know, in secret, it becomes a major problem because there's a lot of people invested in keeping the war going. So they and their child, Hazel, have to go into hiding and go on the run. And it's told from Hazel in the future, we don't know when, it's an adult version of Hazel, narrating basically her life story. But it's also the story of just this galaxy that has been created. It's been described as like Game of Thrones meets Romeo and Juliet in space, but it's even better than that. It's like, I can't even go into all the details detail but there's there's just so much detail in the world there's there's a royal family made of aliens that have television sets for heads and they only communicate some of them with pictures that flash on their screens there's a cat that can tell when you're lying and it'll, it'll voice if you're lying i don't know how it tells that but it does uh, there's, i should warn there's a lot of violence there's full nudity there's sex there's language so it's not for everyone and Speaking from experience, I wouldn't recommend reading this on the bus because sometimes people look over their shoulder and they'll see something that they shouldn't see. I can't, I don't even want to like flip through it and show you the art in case I land on something that might offend someone. If you're, if you know someone who isn't like sensitive to any of that stuff, it's such a good story and it's started, it goes by chapters. This is, you know, chapter one. It's on chapter 55 now and it keeps going. It was on hiatus for like two or three years, but it's back now, so it's a perfect time. It just came back like a few months ago, I think. So it's the perfect time to just like get into it. It's just it's such a well developed world and just just this ongoing saga of all these people and I just I cannot praise it enough. So now on to you, Deegan. Thanks, Carly. All right, so my next pick is for I would say that this one is for teens. I really wanted to find a book that I could recommend for teens. And I know that teens are hard. They are hard to shop for. And it's hard to find a book that you think is going to re really resonate with like a lot of teens. So this one is for the teens, but it's also for everyone on your list that's hard to shop for. Especially, I think this is going to really appeal to dads as well. And I have a dad that is hard to shop for. So what if two? Uh, and so what this is, this book is by Randall Monroe, who is a cartoonist, and he does these amazing, hilarious cartoons all about um, improbable scientific situations, I guess, is how I would describe them. And so he has these really funny scientific cartoons that are often answering um, questions. And the questions are often things like if you had, you know, 500 Tyrannosaurus Rexes, you know, how many horses would you need to defeat them in a battle? And then he goes into these really in-depth, well-researched scientific answers um, and with cartoons. So it's really great. And one of the best things about this book is that it's all really short chapters. So every chapter is a question that someone has sent into him to be answered. Um, and it, so it's really short chapters and it's really easy to dip in and out of. So there's no pressure with this book whatsoever. You could pick it up, read it for 10 minutes, read it for an hour. Um, it's one of those really nice books as well. If you're having a vision of people kind of like hanging out, you've just eaten a giant dinner, you can read them like five minutes from this book and everyone has like a really good time. 
Um, yeah, so that's my recommendation for teens and hard to shop for people. What if two? There you go. All right, Courtney, back to you. Not gonna lie, I took out both the first and the second one once I saw that you picked that. And I think I'm gonna recommend to my partner that we read them together next because I think he'll really like them. All right, it's time people, lightning rounds. So this time we go fast. And now I'm delving into my favorite place, the world of picture books. If you don't know Mother Bruce, I like I welcome, you should be here already. It's so good. I have literally bought, it's a series of uh, like seven plus books now and they have them picture books. Um, he's got like early readers and he's got little books. He's got board books. He's got everything. They're amazing. Bruce is grumpy. This is why I love Bruce. He just is grumpy man, grumpy bear. Very happy. Um, he likes to keep to himself. He likes to be alone and eat eggs. But when his hard boiled goose eggs turn out to be real live goslings, he starts to lose his appetite. And even worse, the goslings are convinced he's their mother. So Bruce tries to get the geese to go south, but he can't seem to get rid of them. What is a bear to do? Um, they're funny. They're so funny, unconventional families. Um, it's the perfect story time read for kids who love to laugh with great illustrations. I used to do this one for story time. And it's just like, cause there's big pages, there's little pages, the geese are there, it's so good. Anything by Ryan T. Higgins, I will co-sign. Like, carte blanche. The dude is hilarious. He does the drawings. It's great. He also has a series called Penelope Rex, which is something called, like, We Don't Eat Our Classmates, which my teeny tiny niece thinks is amazing because this T-Rex is, like, chewing on little children. Um, <laughs> so it's good for kids of all ages. My older niece still likes to read these two, but they're hilarious. That was not fast at all. I I that I failed. You have to do better than me, Toby. Sorry. Um, I will try. Um, all right. Um, so my next pick is um an another popular book that I couldn't get my hands on, so I have a printed out page. Um, I Who Have Never Known Men by Jacqueline Hartman. Um, this book was originally written in French. Um, this is like for your feminist edgy niece. Um, who. Uh, liked sort of dystopian YA and is ready for something more adult. Um, this is about 40 women who live in a cage underground where they're overlooked by silent guards. Um, the women have very little memory of any sort of life before they were imprisoned and the youngest one who is the protagonist has no memory of her life before this. And I'm putting it in the lightning round because I'm going to leave the plot there because if I say any more, I'm going to give too much away. Um, but this, this is dark, man. This is dark and bleak and depressing, um, but so compelling. This is a short book. It's not long. I found it really hard to put down, but bleak, very, very bleak. So, so just be warned about that. Um, so that's I Who Have Never Known Men by Jacqueline Hartman. Oh, and to you, Carly. Thank you. So my next book is for young people. Um, I think the age range is 13 to 15, but it's basically anyone who likes juvenile literature. It's called Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children. And it's the first in a series. It's written by Ransom Riggs. And it's about these children who, for reasons unknown, have powers of some kind. But they're not like always, like, they're not like X-Men. They're like, one girl has a mouth in the back of her head. One girl can't stay on the ground unless she's weighted down because she'll just float away and these children are called peculiars and they live in a time loop which is the same day repeating over and over again which is headed by their headmistress miss Peregrine, and they're hiding because there are these creatures called the hollow ghasts that are these like monsters that want to hunt and consume them so we're following this young man called jacob who stumbles upon this time loop ends up thrust into the middle of the battle, learns all about the peculiars, this history they have, and the hollow gas. It's just, it's a really great read. It's illustrated with these pictures. I could try to show you really quick. Black and white photos that the author found They're from his personal collection. And he just uses them throughout the book to illustrate what's going on. It's really the 
perfect book if you're if you know someone who's into fantasy and they want to like move on from Harry Potter and because it's better than the Harry Potter in my humble opinion or they just want a new like kind of fantastic read kind of like uh, Percy Jackson this is a great series to pick up I highly recommend it and it's much better than the movie so if you saw the movie don't worry the movie was horrible so uh, on to you Tegan Thanks, Carly. That one looks really excellent. Okay, so my next book, this is for people who are having a baby or who just had a baby. This is for everyone on your list who is in that sort of baby phase. We love you as much as the fox loves its tail. Um, this is just a beautiful sort of bedtime, you know, read to a baby book. Um, it's set in the Arctic and it's just got these gorgeous illustrations. We'll love you as much as the polar bear loves to sleep. Will love you as much as the blue beluga loves to dive deep. I think this is going to turn into like a really like a bedtime, a children's classic, um, kind of similar to like the very hungry caterpillar. I think it's kind of just a beautiful classic, great for people who are having a baby. All right, Courtney, your turn. Oh, sounds good. Okay, last one. It's Cody. Cody's so good. This is a graphic novel, and I just fell in love with the pretty trying. Look at that bear. Oh, so good. So Cody is a middle grade graphic novel. We have it in print, it's about 176 pages. And it is the story of two friends separated by everything in the world except love. Isn't that heartwarming? So Katya and her Mima are at the cottage in Alaska where Katya meets the biggest creature she's ever met, an enormous Kodiak bear. And soon it becomes her closest friend, but Katya has to go home to Seattle and they're torn apart and Cody has to do whatever he can to be reunited, reunited with his fragile human friend. How cute. Um, it's adorable. It has great art and it's the perfect read for anybody who's looking for like a sweet whimsical story about defying the odds. Like heartwarming. Sign me up. It's great. All right. That was about a minute. I'll take it. Your turn. Thank you. Um, I also have a graphic novel. Um, my last pick is Roaming um, by Jillian Tamaki and Mariko Tamaki. Um, they are cousins um, and they have previously written um, young adults graphic novels, including This One Summer, which won the Governor General's Award. Um, but now they've teamed up to write this adult graphic novel. Um, so yeah, give this to anyone who likes graphic novels, people who are nostalgic, people who love New York, um, your cool musician uncle or like your artsy cousin. Um, this is just a gorgeous graphic novel about three friends. They're all in their first year of undergraduate degrees and they go on a trip together to, to New York City, um, roaming, both referring to the fact that they're roaming around and also, you know, that they have to put their cell phones on roaming because they're from Canada and they are in New York. Um, so this is just, you know, a slice of life that really perfectly captures what it's like to be on the precipice of adulthood. Um, I really like this quote on the back that says, NYC youth magic on a platter scuffed with glitter. Um, the illustrations are gorgeous, um, even though it's a pretty limited um, color palette. Um, she just like she captures the vibrancy and the um, aliveness of New York City. Um, just just a beautiful, easy, um, gorgeous novel, a uh, gorgeous graphic novel that I, I enjoyed immensely and I will probably reread several times. Um, on to you, Car Carly. Thank you, Toby. So my last one is, it's by the same author as The Twyford Code. That was an accident, I'm sorry, but hopefully you really like it. You're like, oh, good, another book by her. So it's called The Appeal. And it's a, a theater troupe who are putting on a play. And the whole thing is told through emails and WhatsApp conversations and text messages and letters. So it's kind of a good gift for someone who wants to read kind of a unique reading experience. It's a mystery, but it's, it's, it's just written differently than a lot of mysteries would be written. And midway through the book, someone dies. And it's just trying to piece together what happened, who's telling the truth, who's lying. And it's just, it's like a really great character study of all these characters because even though they'll say one thing, you'll then get like an email from them, they'll say something else or text someone something 
that contradicts what they just said. So it's like piecing together the mystery yourself and putting you in the role of detective. And it just came out with a Christmas sequel. It's really small. So it like, would be the perfect gift, given this, and then add this on top of it. So that is my suggestion. And now on to Keegan. Thank you. Okay, I love Christmas themed books. So that looks so good. All right, my next book is for babies. This book is for babies. It's also good for toddlers. I think this would actually appeal to probably to zero to fours even, maybe five-year-olds. It's really funny. I don't think five-year-olds would get as much like reread value out of it because I think the zero to twos, they're always hungry. I'm Hungry by Elise Gravel. It's so cute. Um, look at these bright, bold illustrations. They eat some pizza, and after they eat that pizza, they eat a whole lot of other things, including the fridge. And then, oh man, they're starting to think about eating you. And I'm not going to tell you what happens. I'm not going to spoil the ending, but it is a page turner. So that's my recommendation for all the little babies. Okay, Courtney, it's yours. That is that is a solid one. We finished early. Girls, high five, team. Even with me waxing on poetically about things, we did it. So that's it. That's like 20 books in just over 40 minutes. That's not bad. Pretty good at this. Um, thank you for being here with us today. We'll be emailing everybody an evaluation form for the program. So let us know what you thought. We welcome any and all feedback. We hope you'll be able to see us again in the new year for our next offering of Next Page Live, which will be, mark your calendars, of February 5th, 2024. Let's not talk about 2024 yet, my word. Anyway, we'll uh, get back to that later. That's kind of it for the night. Thank you for coming, everybody, um, and have a great night. Bye.